Welcome to the lectures on Advanced Quantum Chemistry, Hard to Fog Theory, Lecture 1. In this lecture I will give a short overview of what Hard to Fog Theory is, and in the following lectures we will look more at the details and at the derivation. There are several ways how one can describe what Hard to Fog Theory is. One way is to say that Hartree-Fock theory is a variational method, meaning it starts from the variational principle and the wave function in is then optimized to give the lowest energy. There are other methods which use the variation principle where the wave function or the parameters in the wave function are then variationally optimized to give the lowest energy. What is particular about Hartree-Fock theory is that the approximate wave function, which is optimized, consists of only one single Slater determinant. So one can see that say that Hartree-Fock theory gives the best approximation to the energy, which is possible with one single Slater determinant. The Slater determinant here we have one is, as you learned in the previous lectures an antisymmetrized product of spin orbitals. And in order to get this antisymmetrized product, we can use the trick of writing um, this product of spin orbitals up in a Slater determinant. But it's essentially just uh, uh, this product of spin orbitals. And all the spin orbitals which are included in the hart fock determinant, we call occupied orbitals because they are used for um, the artifact fock determinant. So if you want to optimize this artifact fock determinant in order to give the lowest energy with the variation principle, what can we optimize there? Well, what we can optimize, of course, is uh, the spin orbitals. So the artifact fock theory gives us spin orbitals, which will give the lowest possible artifact fock energy. Then we have to look at the energy, the expression for the hart fock energy, and the hart fock energy is calculated from this single Slater determinant here, and the full non-relativistic Hamiltonian in the born oppenheimer approximation. And this is important that you remember that this is the full Hamiltonian, which we use here to calculate the uh, hart fock energy. And of course, for, for using the variation principle, we have to calculate the energy as this expectation value. Now, if we insert the Hamiltonian, then of course we have a sum over all electrons. So here we have the sum over all electrons. And here this operator H, we call the core Hamiltonian. That's a one electron operator, where the first part is just the kinetic energy operator for electron one here. And then it's the Coulomb interaction, which is an attraction, Coulomb attraction between this electron 1 and all the nuclei which we have in the molecule or in the atom, then of course it's only one, so all the nuclei which they are there and set A is the atomic number. So, so this is sort of the uh, uh, nuclear charge times the electronic charge. And we have one of these operators for each electron, so we have a sum over here. Um, and coming from, from this line to, to that line, of course, I use the schlater canon rules to evaluate the, the integrals over these operators, here the core uh, Hamiltonian operators, the first one, which is a one electron operator, with a determinant. So it's a simple application of schlater canon rules. We have the same determinant on both sides, and we have a one electron operator, so you get a sum over the one electron integrals then. Um, and correspondingly, we have the electron-electron interaction operator here. Um, and that's a two-electron operator. And if you then have the same Slater determinants on both sides, the uh, slater conon rules tell you that you get a double sum over uh, two electron, two orbital indices. Here I call them I and J. And then this this uh, uh, difference of uh, two types of electron uh, integrals, two electron integrals. And the first one where we have electron one uh, 
um, described by spin orbital psi i, and electron 2 described by spin orbital psi j. Here you have the definition of the integral, so it's electron 1 in psi, and we have electron 2 here in psi j. Um, that we call a Coulomb integral, and the second integral here, where you can see that uh, on the in the ket we have interchanged the two uh, uh, spin orbitals. That's called an exchange integral because we have exchanged or interchanged the two uh, um, spin orbitals, and this is a consequence of uh, working with. An anti-symmetrized product of uh, spin orbitals, meaning working with the Slater determinant. So this is the expression for the Hutterfock energy, and uh, what we have to do now is to, by variational principle, to find uh, spin orbitals which give psi, or psi j, which give the lowest value of this energy. This means. What we are actually going for is equations for these uh, spin orbitals, and they are called the Hutterford equations. Now, before we can do that, there is also another condition, and that condition is that the spin orbitals have to stay orthonormal. So that's an extra condition which uh, has to be fulfilled uh, and which we use in the derivation of the Hutterford equations. As I said before, the, the derivation itself uh, we'll discuss later on. Let's just uh, jump over that and come direct, directly to what is called the Hutterford equations. And you can see I, I call them here the integral differential equations um, because uh, in the first place it is a differential equation and it's a differential equation because this core Hamiltonian H here, remember from the uh, slide before, the core Hamiltonian H uh, has the first contribution is the kinetic energy operator and the kinetic energy operator in quantum mechanics is uh, the Laplacian operator so it's a sum of the second partial derivatives with respect to the x y z coordinates of the electron so therefore it's a differential equation now why it's called an integral differential equation well that's because of these operators here uh, j prime and k prime, which we're going to discuss on, on the following slides. Uh, and we will see there that those two operators in reality in, include an integral. So therefore it's called integral differential equations. And then uh, you can also actually see that you, we could give it a third name because here in the parenthesis we have an operator and this operator, so it's, a, it's actually called the Fock operator, it consists of this uh, core Hamiltonian and what we call the Hutter-Fock potential. The Hutter-Fock potential is just the sum over these uh, um, Coulomb and exchange operators. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this operator depends just on the position of uh, or acts on uh, electron one or on one electron. So it's a one electron operator, it's an effective one electron operator. And this Hutter-Fock potential, as we're going to see later, is uh, an effective one electron operator describing the interaction, the average interaction with all the other electrons. So all the thing what we have in the parenthesis here, that is here in this parenthesis, that is this Fock operator F. So what we actually have, we have an operator acting on spin orbital psi i. And uh, the equation said that this is equal to some uh, constant epsilon i which we call the orbital energy, times the spin orbital back. So this equation 5, the, the Hutter-Fock equation, is actually also an eigenvalue equation. So it's an, it has integrals, it has a differential operator, and it's an eigenvalue equation. Now it's this eigenvalue equation, which is a differential equation, uh, which we have to solve. Uh, because the what we stuff into what we put into the equation are these operators and we have to find the functions which are eigenfunctions to this operator and the eigenfunctions are then going to be our orbitals which if we include the ones with the lowest uh, uh, orbital energy in the Hartefog determinant we will get 
the lowest possible Hartig fock energy. And in addition to the to the spin orbitals as the eigenfunctions of the Fock operator, we also get uh, the orbital energies as the eigenvalues out. So, so the output is the orbital energies and uh, the spin orbitals. Now, to, uh, to the slide before, where we have the Hartig fock uh, equations, we can see, or you can see, that we sum here over all uh, spin orbitals j, which are occupied. So in this one, we have the interaction of electron 1 with uh, all the other electrons, because we sum over the uh, all the occupied orbitals. So here in the... Let's look at uh, the operators. The core melton we already uh, talked about, so let's look at the Coulomb operator. And here I'll present it in the form of uh, in spin orbitals, and that's also the reason why uh, there is this prime up there, J prime, Always when it's prime, then it's uh, in terms of spin orbitals. Later we will uh, get a Coulomb operator, which is in spatial orbitals. So that Coulomb operator, as I said before, actually includes an integral, or is an integral here. It's an integral over the uh, position and the spin. So it's x, which stands for the three spatial coordinates, x, y, z, plus a, a spin coordinate of electron 2. And what do we have here? Well, we have 1 over R12. So that's just the Coulomb interaction operator between electron 1 and electron 2. And what do we have in this Coulomb operator? It's not just 1 over R12, which would be the, the correct electron-electron uh, interaction operator. But what we do, we integrate over the position and the spin over electron 2. So we sort of integrate out, we average out, the position of electron 2. Um, and of course we uh, what what we have up here that's the uh, norm squared of uh, a spin orbital j which we use to describe electron 2. So so uh, the norm squared that is just uh, according to Born's interpretation of wave function this is just the density uh, of electron 2. So we average the interaction between electron 1 with electron 2 here. We average that over the whole space uh, and take the uh, positions or the, the density of electron 2 described by a spin orbital j. So therefore we have here j. If we go back for us in this integral, we would then have all the different orbitals describing other electrons. The Coulomb operator is a, is a local operator, and so the Coulomb potential is, is a local potential. And you can clearly see that when you apply the Coulomb operator to uh, a spin orbital here, ps, psi i, uh, for electron 1, because what you basically just do, you multiply the spin orbital psi i, describing electron 1, with that integral here, this integral there, which, which is this Coulomb operator. operator. So, so in order to apply the Coulomb operator on the spin orbital psi i, you actually don't need to know anything apart the value of the spin orbital psi i at that position you're, you're interested in, and the position where, where you have electron 1 here. This is just a multiplicative operator. Now, the integrals over the Coulomb operator, so if you take this Coulomb operator and you sort of sandwich it with uh, um, psi i, uh, on the right hand side and, and multiply from the left with the bra or project against the bra of psi on the left hand side. So you can integral over the Coulomb operator. That looks like this. And this is precisely the, the Coulomb integral which we had uh, before on, on the first slide in the um, Hartree Fock energy. And uh, as I said, it's a local operator, but not only that, but it's basically just the classical Coulomb interaction. Because if we would have, uh, say, if we would like to know what is the uh, Coulomb interaction by two charge distributions, charge distribution of uh, one electron and another electron, then we, we would is precisely write this integral up. Because here this part, psi i, complex conjugate psi i, uh, that is just the uh, density of 
electron one in the spin orbital psi i and psi j uh, complex conjugate of two times psi j that's just that is precisely what we have up here that's the norm square of uh, the value of psi j at, at this position and this is the density according to bond interpretation this is the density of electron two in psi j so accordingly this one is the density of electron one in spin orbital psi i and therefore what we have here we have the cool classical Coulomb cool interaction between an electron density here for for electron one and another electron density for electron two and we integrate over the whole space so this is just an integral of the classical Coulomb operator here the result of the operator acting on psi i only depends on the value of psi i at the position uh, of electron one now the exchange operator is different and you can see already uh, that i can't write up an expression for the exchange operator alone and this is because it's a non-local operator so it's not just a simple potential uh, uh, which you can write up what the value of this potential is at a particular point in space. Uh, the only thing I can write up is the action of the exchange operator. Because when you apply this exchange operator to um, an electron 1 described by the spin orbital psi i, I again I get an integral over all positions of electron 2, but this integral now is not multiplied with on psi i again but it's actually on psi j and that is because i have this exchange because it comes from 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 the fact that i used an anti-symmetrized uh, uh, product wave function i used as later determined so here i have this exchange and therefore i can't write this up i can't write up just the exchange operator without applying it to another function because this function here goes into the integral so i need to know on which a spin orbital I want to apply the exchange operator before I can write up how the exchange operator looks like. Uh, so it's a, it's a non-local uh, operator. Um, which means that the result depends not only on the value of psi i at a particular position, which was the case here, whereas here uh, the result of psi i of the exchange operator acting on psi i depends on the value of psi i at all positions in space, in the, over the whole space, because I integrate here over the whole space. So therefore it's a non-local operator. The integral over the exchange operator here, that's going to be the exchange integral, no surprise. And that's the same story as for the Coulomb integral. If you sandwich it between uh, the same spin orbital, then you get this in, uh, uh, exchange integral where, as we discussed before, now here for uh, in the cat side, uh, psi i and psi j is interchanged. The exchange um, interaction, the exchange integral, the exchange operator are all non-classical, which means there is no corresponding interaction in classical mechanics, classical electromagnetism. Uh, it's a purely uh, quantum effect and it, it purely arises from the fact that we use an anti-symmetrized um, product wave function. So if you would, instead of a Slater determinant, uh, we just use a simple uh, product wave function of spin orbitals, so-called Hart product, then you actually would not get an uh, exchange contribution. 